Good morning and welcome to our service. It's lovely to see you again. Before I start the service this morning, I have a notice. As a church, we have decided that we're going to support the food bank in, run by the little cafe in Burstall. So we would ask anyone coming to church if you would bring a can or a packet of something or some dry goods, some toilet rolls, that sort of thing. Nothing fresh. So that we can take it across to them on a Wednesday and then they can distribute it to those who need it the most. So in anticipation, I'll say thank you. Today is the second Sunday in Advent. And last Sunday, we lit the candle of hope. Today, we light the candle of peace. Knowing that Jesus alone can make us feel at rest in this chaotic world. He calms our hearts as we await his second coming. Let's say the prayer together. Lord God, Give us the gift of Jesus and the Spirit so that our hearts can be calm and peaceful. Help us to know how close you are to us all the time and help us to show you and your peace to other people too. Amen. We say together our opening prayer. Lord, Direct our thoughts, teach us to pray, lift up our hearts to worship you in spirit and in truth, through Jesus Christ. Amen. We have come together this morning in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world and to seek forgiveness for our sins. That by the power of the Holy Spirit, we may give ourselves to the service of God. Blessed is the Lord, for he has heard the voice of our prayer. Therefore shall our hearts dance for joy and in our song, we will praise our God. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you. Now, we're going to have some music. Royal David 
our childhood's pattern Day by day, like us he grew He was little, weak and helpless Tears and smiles, like us he knew And he cares when we are sad And he shares when we We come before God to say sorry for our wrongdoings where we failed him and those around us. When the Lord comes, he will bring the light to light things now hidden in the darkness and will disclose the purposes of our heart. In that light, let us confess our sins. Lord, without you, we would not be able to live, for you are our light and our life. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, without you, we would not know the joy of relationship, for you sustain us with your love. Christ, have mercy. Have mercy. Lord, without you, we would have no hope, for you guide us in the way of salvation. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. So let us confess our wrongdoings before our Heavenly Father. We say together, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you through our own fault, in thought and word and deed, and in what we have left undone. We are heartily sorry and repent of all our sins. For your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. May the Father of all mercies cleanse us from our sins and restore us in his image to the praise and glory of his name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now Elaine is going to read for us from the New Testament. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives, as you look forward to the day of God 
and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with this promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless and at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as the dear brother Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom that God gave him. This is the word of the Lord. I hand you over to Michael, who is going to read our gospel and talk to us. Good morning, my name's Andy and I'm here to bring you the gospel reading this morning. The gospel reading is taken from Mark chapter 1, verses 1 to 8. Here, John the Baptist announces the good news that the people of Israel had waited hundreds of years to hear that the Lord is coming. John prepares the ordinary everyday people around him by reminding them of the ancient prophecies recorded in the scriptures and begins to prepare the people by calling them for a change of heart, preparing them for repentance so that their sins may be forgiven. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptised by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel hair, with a leather belt around his waist. He ate locusts and wild honey, and his message was, After me comes one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptise you with water, but he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit. This is the word of God. May I speak and may you hear in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, my early memories of elections are of the monster raving loony party. They seemed completely bonkers to me. And I really couldn't understand how someone who seemed like a children's entertainer was going to help run the country. But although they seemed bonkers, there was something about them that interested me. And you see, eccentrics, oddballs and non-conventional types who carry a hint of edginess are always the source of excitement and interest, don't you think? Now, if the description in this morning's Gospel reading is anything to go by, they don't come much stranger than John the Baptist. Mark's Gospel tells us that John's, John appeared in the wilderness and what a stirring, startling sight that must have been. I would guess he'd already spent a lot of time there as some sort of hermit because he emerges as a wild man, dressed in animal skins and eating locusts washed down with wild honey. I wonder why John spent or misspent his youth like this. Well, perhaps like some of his contemporaries, and like some people today, he felt the need to withdraw from everyday life for a time to ponder his future direction. But we meet him as that desert period was coming to an end. The Gospel writers 
tell us that John did indeed have a task to perform, which was to call people to re-examine their lives, to baptise them with a new kind of baptism, and to prepare the way for Jesus. Well, this morning's reading, which we haven't heard from Isaiah, makes it clear that the wilderness was a place of deep significance for Israel. It was the place where the Israelites under Moses had encountered God. The place where God had led them for 40 years before bringing them to the promised land, where they learned about their particular status as a chosen people, and where they were moulded into a community that would be in a position to carry out their role. In many ways, though, it was the very unpromising place for these things to happen. After all, the wilderness was a place of danger and deprivation. Steep, wild, rocky, barren, almost devoid of vegetation. Where to lose your way meant almost certain death. The wilderness made demands on people. It was difficult to survive the physical realities and the extremes of heat and cold, as well as the intense isolation. Small wonder then that the wilderness was a place of testing and sometimes for the ancient Israelites a place of failure. Yet it continued to feature strongly in Israel's history as a place of preparation. We also recall Jesus' own 40 days in the wilderness prior to his public ministry. I guess all of us find ourselves in our own desert places from time to time. And in all sorts of ways, physically, psychologically, emotionally, spiritually. I'm talking about those times in our lives when we wonder about our own future and what we feel we should be doing and our own direction of travel. Or those times when we feel the need to withdraw from the world because of what life throws at us. And it feels like the odds are against us. Those uncomfortable moments when the facade breaks down, pretensions have to go, and we find ourselves exposed and confronted with the reality of who we really are. Those times when the props we employ to keep us going and to dull the pain fail, and we are forced to rely on our own resources and just get on with it. Those times when we feel intensely lonely, when no one wants to know, and God seems to be at best remote, or at worst absent. The wilderness was often an uncomfortable place for the people of Israel, but it was a place of reality, and it still is for us today, metaphorically, not a place of escape, but a place of experience. You see, in the desert, we begin to see clearly, perhaps too clearly for comfort, and that reality can be painful. But it isn't necessarily negative. The experience of being in the desert and the clarity it can bring means we can begin to move closer to the heart of things, sort our priorities and make plans. It's not a place for self-indulgence or morose feelings, but rather a place which, used productively, can enable us to look positively towards the future. There is good news in the desert, and we read about it in Isaiah's prophecy, which refers to the coming time when God's reign takes root. Isaiah's vision is of a time when the rough places of the desert will make plain and the crooked places straight. The uneven ground will become level. Not only that, but the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. This prophetic hope is no wishy-washy optimism that one day things might just possibly get a bit better. Isaiah's words are firmly grounded in the vision of a time when he calls the glory of the Lord will be revealed. Now, what glory often implies 
power and might. And indeed, Isaiah talks of God coming in might. But it's worth noting, Isaiah links the power of this coming reign of God with gentleness and compassion. For he will feed his flock like a shepherd, gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom. No wonder this piece of prophecy with the words, Comfort ye, comfort ye my people. This assures us all is not lost, even when we suspect it might be. God is on our side after all. However, we cannot ignore the fact that the voice of the prophets call us towards fundamental change and realignment where these things might be needed. So I want to encourage you this morning to think what it could mean for the parched desert places of your life to blossom, its rough places to be made plain, and its crooked places made straight. For Christians, this symbolic, poetic imagery from the prophet is made real in Advent hope. As we prepare to celebrate the incarnation, the coming of the God who enters quietly, humbly, but decisively into the desert places of our human experience and promises to transform them. Amen. We stand before God and say what we believe in the words of the Creed. Together we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin, Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now we come to the peace. If there's anyone you would wish the peace of God to fall upon this morning, please post their names in the comments box. Let's think of all the people we want to share the peace with today. In the kingdom of God, there is peace, justice and joy. Let us begin to share the peace with one another. The peace of the Lord be always with you. I will worship. Thank you. 
Alison will lead us in our prayers and intercessions. Now we come to our time of prayer. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, you promised through your Son, Jesus Christ, to hear us when we pray in faith. We pray for the witness of the Church this week, particularly in those places where the Christian faith is ignored and forgotten. We pray for those who carry the weight of responsibility as bishops and church leaders, who are all expected to know what to do and what to say, whatever the situation. Give them compassion, wisdom and the mind of Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, in this season of Advent, when we look back to the coming of your Son among us and forward to his coming again, we pray for the change of heart that encourages all of us to mend our sinful ways, that restores our integrity and allows us once more to rejoice in the light of his presence. We pray for those who cannot see any need for repentance, 
and who claim to have no need of you. May their eyes and hearts be open to the reality of your love and of your judgment. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray for our parish. May we all find ways to pass on the good news of your Son, Jesus Christ, and to show his love by the example of our daily lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray for our country as we prepare for Christmas in so many different ways. We pray for all who, for whom Christmas will not be a time of happiness and rejoicing, but a time of tension and anxiety through relationship or financial issues. We think of those who just this week have learned of the probable loss of their jobs and those who will be relying on food banks for their Christmas cheer. We pray for those who will be alone and those who will be separated by coronavirus from their loved ones. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray for all those suffering in body, mind or spirit, through sickness or accident, through bereavement or just the circumstances of life, and for those suffering alongside them and caring for them. We pray especially this week for Fred and Anne. May they all receive from you strength and hope, and may the good news of Jesus Christ be heard more and more through all the adversities of our daily living. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask you to listen to these and to all our prayers. Give us the strength to live your gospel and the courage to be witnesses to your truth at work, at home, and in the communities where we spend our lives. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now a prayer about our hopes for a new vicar at St Peter's. Heavenly Father, as we bring our hearts and minds to bear on the appointment of a new priest to lead us, we are mindful that you already know who you wish that person to be. As we go through our time of examination, of ourselves, our church and our community. Guide our praying, thinking and consultation and help us to define qualities that accord with your will for us and to recognise them in your chosen candidate. We pray for that person. May he or she, even now, be sensing a call to make a new start in our parish. Until that time, we ask for your blessing on us as we work together to serve you and our community. In Jesus' name we offer you our prayer. Amen. And the collect or special prayer for today. Almighty God, purify our hearts and minds that when your Son Jesus Christ comes again as Judge and Saviour, we may be ready to receive him, who is our Lord and our God. Amen. We pray together the prayer our Saviour taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Blessed be your name, land that is plentiful where your streams of abundance flow blessed be your name blessed be your name when i'm found in the desert place and i walk through the wilderness blessed be your name Every blessing you pour out, I'll 
turn back to pray when the darkness closes in Lord still I will say blessed be the name of the Lord blessed be your name blessed be the name of the Lord blessed be your glorious name blessed be your name the sun's shining down on me the world's fall as it should be blessed be your name blessed be your name the road marked with suffering that there's pain in the offering blessed be your name every blessing you pour out I'll turn back to praise when the darkness closes in or still I will say blessed be the name of the Lord blessed be your name blessed be the name of the Lord blessed be your glorious name blessed be the name of the Lord blessed be your name blessed be the name of the Lord blessed be your glorious name you give and take away you give and take away my heart will choose to say Lord, blessed be your name, you give and take away, you give and take away, my heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. So we come to the end of our service. Thank you so much for being with us and worshipping with us. We think it's wonderful that you join us and we really hope you'll join us again next week or come and see us in church. Now we can go there. A final prayer. May the God of power open our hearts to welcome him. May he remove all that hinders us from receiving him with joy. May we share his wisdom and be at one with him. And may the blessing of God the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon us and those whom we love now and forever. Amen. So let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.
Thank you.